tangled terror. Jill tripped over a carpet of decaying leaves and brittle twigs in the forest's suffocating grip. Her cries for Jeremy, her trusted companion and boyfriend, echoed into the vast unknown. The only reply was an eerie silence that filled every secluded nook of the woodland. A creeping fear gnawed at her courage as countless hours slipped away in a fruitless search. Her aimless wanderings led her to a clearing where a colossal web spanned, shimmering under the moonlight like a satin snare. At its heart dwelt an immense spider, its eight eyes burning with an ominous red glow, all focused on her. A wave of sheer horror washed over Jill as those eyes turned toward her. The creature's black body pulsed with palpable malice as it moved forward on thin legs covered with spiked fur. It emitted a menacing hiss, revealing sharp fangs that shone threateningly in the scant light. She attempted to run but found herself trapped by something sticky at her feet. She was caught in part of its web. As this behemoth loomed over her, she ineffectively struggled against her bonds, but she was snagged like an unsuspecting moth in its deadly lure. The spider crept closer still, puffing its hot breath onto her face, its massive jaws unhinged revealing rows upon rows of needle-like teeth before it lunged at her with terrifying speed, sinking its fangs deep into her neck. Pain exploded through Jill as venom coursed through her veins. She fought fiercely but was soon drained by its poisonous bite. The creature's eight legs pinned her down while it struck again. More poison inundated Jill and she knew death was near. Resigned to her fate, she closed her eyes awaiting oblivion. When she opened them again, there was no monster looming above, just remnants of the web stuck to her skin. Confused but relieved, she sat up, her body aching from the spider's assault. How she had escaped its deadly grasp remained a mystery. As Jill made her way back through the dense forest, she couldn't shake the feeling that she had been protected by some unseen power. But who could it be, and how? Her return journey was fraught with uncertainty as she looked for signs of civilization or Jeremy. After what seemed like an eternity, a dim light flickered in the distance. A beacon of hope bloomed within her as it guided her back to the campsite. As the sun dipped below the horizon, Jeremy's empty spot around the campfire remained untouched. The logs were now just charred remnants and the smoke had long since dissipated into the night sky. Silence hung heavily in the air, a stark contrast to the laughter and chatter from earlier in the evening. She'd made it back to the origin of her adventure. But where was Jeremy, and who had saved her from the evil clutches of the eight-legged fiend? Unseen by Jill and tucked away in the forest's dismal undergrowth, the spider maintained its foreboding watch patiently waiting for another unsuspecting soul to blunder into its lethal labyrinth. Each night was spent warring against sleep, as vivid images of the spider invaded Jill's dreams. In the nightmares she was caught in a sticky trap, frozen as the spider crept ominously closer. These midnight terrors soaked her in icy sweat and left her shaking upon waking. She tried to push away the memories of the spider, but they remained stubbornly persistent in her mind. With each passing day, Jill wearily trudged along the streets, putting up flyers in every corner and seeking out any assistance from the authorities to find her missing boyfriend. Jeremy seemed to have disappeared without a trace. Mentally and physically battered and bruised, she was exhausted, yet refused to give up on her search for Jeremy. As she made her way home from work one day, a hideous creature loomed in the shadows of a deserted alleyway. It was shaped like a spider its large body creating an unsettling silhouette against the dimly lit cobblestones. The intricate web it had spun glinted under the weak light of a street lamp, a macabre masterpiece of death's design. A shiver ran down Jill's spine as she realized the chilling truth. This monster wasn't just coincidentally in her path, it had followed her. The spider turned toward her, and she felt its sinister stare piercing into her soul. Fear rooted her to the spot, no screams broke free as it edged nearer. Just as she was about to succumb to the hopelessness she felt, a loud crash reverberated through the alleyway. A stranger appeared seemingly out of nowhere, wielding a baseball bat which he swung at the spider's head with deadly accuracy. The creature tumbled to the ground. Jill's legs buckled beneath her as she collapsed onto the pavement, her body trembling from exhaustion and gratitude for the unexpected hero who had saved her life. He knelt beside her his hand reaching out to help her up as he assessed her condition. Tears streamed down Jill's face as she nodded gratefully and expressed thanks for this stranger's life-saving intervention. But as he vanished into the shadows, leaving behind unanswered questions about his identity and intentions, she couldn't shake off the unsettling feeling that something wasn't quite right. 
Her hands shook as she fumbled with the keys to her apartment door. Every time she closed her eyes, the horrifying encounter with the giant spider replayed in her mind. It was a miracle that she had survived, all thanks to the brave stranger who had stepped in at that crucial moment. As months passed by, Jill attempted to bury the traumatic experience and move on with her life. Jeremy was classified as a missing person, but everyone believed he was dead. Just when she thought normalcy was within grasp, a mysterious letter arrived in her mailbox. The sender was Alex, claiming to be part of a secret society dedicated to protecting humanity from monsters and demons. He admitted that he was the one who saved her from the spider but warned that more dangers lurked in the shadows. Curiosity piqued, Jill decided to meet with Alex and learn more about this society. After some initial reluctance, she accepted his offer to join them, knowing that lives were on the line and she couldn't stand idly by. From then on, Jill trained tirelessly alongside Alex and other society members, honing combat skills and learning how to wield various weapons. To her surprise, she discovered latent powers within herself, mastering spells and incantations. In her unique way, joining the society was a tribute to the man she had lost on that fateful night, the night that altered the course of her life forever. Despite facing formidable enemies, Jill was determined to protect our world from impending disaster. The looming battle was intimidating, but it's during times like these that true heroes are forged. Dream Victorian The towering Victorian mansion, our newly claimed prize, loomed over us with a gothic grandeur that made us feel like mere ants beneath its shadow. Its sharp-angled roofline was reminiscent of a cathedral from some ancient horror tale. This was the dream my husband Aaron and I had nurtured for years, to dwell in a historical house tucked away in a charming New England village. Our son Ethan saw it as an exciting maze waiting to be explored, his youthful joy echoing through the labyrinth-like rooms filled with unseen stories. His laughter breathed life into the old wooden bones of the house, their creaks whispering tales of bygone eras. I found solace in the sunlit library teeming with books, while Aaron was captivated by antique photographs and architectural oddities that seemed to transport him back in time. But it wasn't long before strange happenings became impossible to ignore, items disappearing only to reappear elsewhere, doors swinging open unassisted, whispers that sent shivers down our spines. Ethan started sleepwalking, his soft cries during these nocturnal wanderings disturbing our peace. My dreams were plagued by faceless specters and bone-chilling laughter that jolted me awake. Aaron turned to local folklore for answers, but what he discovered only fueled our fears. Our home was allegedly built by an artist named Silas Drew, who was haunted by a spirit he had unintentionally summoned during a forbidden ritual. Armed with this knowledge, Aaron felt obliged to protect us and began studying ancient symbols and rituals, while our once orderly library transformed into a chaotic collection of old texts and drawings. Fear drove me to assist him. One quiet night Ethan sleepwalked again his faint cries guiding us up the groaning staircase toward the slightly open attic door dimly lit by moonlight seeping through a dirty window. Upon entering, an icy breeze snuffed out Aaron's lantern, plunging us into complete darkness. As we scrambled for our lighters, an unusual glow emanated from Ethan, who was floating in mid-air with empty eyes and a strange energy swirling around him. Aaron lunged forward, his hand glowing with inscribed symbols. I attempted to call out his name but my voice betrayed me. Suddenly, an entity radiated intensely before vanishing, leaving Ethan sprawled on the cold floor sporting an unsettling grin. Our dream home had transformed into a living nightmare, reminding us that evil can swiftly eclipse good. The house fell silent once more, but this time we were painfully aware of the lurking menace within its shadowy corners. Over the coming weeks, dawn cast a ghastly glow over our abode as sunlight filtered through stained glass windows casting spectral shadows over everything. The library, once my sanctuary, now resonated with an unsettling aura as ancient books echoed tales of terror. Ethan had changed, too. His laughter was replaced by silence punctuated only by sleep-filled mumblings. An unseen evil had invaded our home, feeding on our fear and growing stronger each day. Trapped in our house by this invisible entity, Aaron and I immersed ourselves in ancient texts, and implored forgotten deities for deliverance. We were desperate to protect Ethan and reclaim our home. Every tiny sound sent chills down our spines. Shadows seemed menacingly alive. 
Ethan's sleepwalking episodes escalated. His lively eyes held a chilling emptiness. Night after night he roamed the corridors under some mysterious influence often found in peculiar locations, including dangerously close to falling off the roof. Aaron persisted in deciphering bygone incantations to banish the fiend, but despite his efforts, he was disheartened by a lack of progress. On a night when the air bit our skin with frosty teeth, we found Ethan teetering on the edge of our house's peak, his eyes empty and lost in the monstrous void below. His form, etched against the lunar glow, struck a ghostly figure that sent shivers of terror snaking down our backs. Aaron, driven by courage born from desperation, rushed forward in a heroic bid to pull our son back from certain doom. As his fingers brushed against Ethan's sleeve, a rogue gust of wind, biting and brutal like winter's wrath, shattered the stillness. Time stretched into an agonizing slow motion as I watched Aaron hang suspended for a heartbeat before gravity claimed him. He spiraled into the abyss beneath us, devoured by the ravenous shadows that eagerly embraced him. The sound that lingered wasn't Aaron's distant cry or even the dreadful thump of his fall. It was Ethan's laughter, an uncanny giggle that twirled on the breeze and sunk its icy talons into my soul. This laughter didn't belong to him. It was owned by something else entirely. This wasn't my son's voice, but rather that of some invisible intruder, malevolent and mocking, laying claim to what was once our sanctuary. In this moment came an unexpected revelation. Ethan had not been teetering on the brink of danger, but rather orchestrating it. And the laughter echoing through the night wasn't just chilling, it was triumphant. An eerie victory cry from whatever fiend had taken residence within our son. The understanding struck me with the force of a brutal gut shot. Aaron hadn't been Ethan's savior from the precipice of disaster. He had willingly flung himself into its malevolent, waiting jaws. The wellspring. The vibrant veins of the city throbbed beneath my gaze, a pulsating display against the pitch-black tapestry of night. It's another Friday, another cycle of guiding faceless passengers to their destinations in my reliable Subaru. The engine's rhythmic drone is a soothing lullaby contrasting with the city's relentless vitality. Then it comes, a ping. An address on the outskirts appears as an anomaly but not unheard of. Easy cash before retiring for the night. He materializes from the murky shadows of a dim alleyway, swathed in a threadbare trench coat that seems to swallow the feeble glow of the streetlights. His face remains hidden under his fedora when he opens the car door, only a sliver of moonlight betraying an eerie calmness in his eyes. Where to? I ask, trying to maintain my usual jovial tone despite his presence sending shivers down my spine. In a gravelly whisper reminiscent of wind sifting through autumn leaves, he says, Take me to the wellspring. My GPS yields no results. I'm not sure I know that place, I say, while stealing cautious glances at him through the rearview mirror. He remains an enigmatic silhouette. You will, he replies. Follow the signs. Let the moon be your guide. Ignoring my gut instinct telling me that something's off, I drive into the winding streets beyond the city's neon glow. The low and swollen moon casts spectral shadows that dance across the deserted roads. The only signs are cryptic messages on decaying walls. Seek the wellspring. Baptism awaits. Lost souls find solace. As we delve deeper into this unknown territory, silence descends like a heavy cloak. It replaces the city's hum with unsettling chirps from unseen insects and rustling wind through bare trees. My phone struggles for a signal, rendering the GPS useless. Fear tightens its grip on me. Then in the distance, a flickering light appears like a lighthouse in an abyss. As we draw nearer, I realize it's emanating from a clearing where a rundown well stands, its stone rim overrun with moss and weeds. The figure steps out, his features still concealed by the hat and circles the well while murmuring an incantation. What's going on? I stammer, fear making my voice hoarse. The cleansing, he replies. You too are tainted. The wellspring offers renewal. Before I can react, he seizes my arm with a surprisingly strong grip and pulls me toward the well. Despite my resistance, it feels as though an unseen force is propelling me forward. He drives me relentlessly toward the precipice, his breath hot and alien against my ear uttering indecipherable syllables in a language that twists my stomach into knots. A primal fear, raw and unfiltered, surges through my veins like molten lead, freezing me in place even as it urges me to flee. 
This is not a simple stumble amidst an otherwise mundane journey. It's a freefall into the abyss of insanity, where reality twists and warps beyond recognition, and the commonplace morphs into something monstrous and unrecognizable. A horrifying shriek reverberates from the depths of the well, not a human sound, but a tortured wail that feels like it could rip through the fabric of reality. My screams join in before both fade into silence. When I regain consciousness, dawn has broken painting the sky a bruised lilac. My head throbs with fragmented memories of fear and chilling darkness. I scramble away from the well's edge which now stands empty. No sign of him or anything unusual. Back at the city limits, my trembling hands dial up the police who find no trace of any oddity at the well site or evidence supporting my claims leading them to dismiss it as an overactive imagination fueled by alcohol. But I know better. His cold touch, those chilling whispers, and the wellspring are etched onto my soul like grotesque tattoos of terror. As weeks turn into months, anxiety lingers like a nightmare refusing to end until the night I spot him again. Same trench coat, same fedora, and the same chilling emptiness in his eyes. He stands across the street, watching me. His teeth under the moonlight are elongated, sharp and glistening with a sadistic sheen. His eyes radiate an otherworldly glow that mirrors the pulsating light from a nearby well. He beckons me closer while that chilling mantra echoes in my mind. Seek the wellspring. Baptism awaits. Panic takes over and I slam on the gas, tires screeching as I speed away into the safety of a fresh day. I never lay eyes on him again, but every moonlit night brings back echoes of the wellspring. I see his face in every crowd, and hear his whispers in every gust of wind. I'm forever marked by this terrifying truth. I was caught in a horrifying paradox. I know he's still out there waiting for another desperate soul seeking solace in the wrong places. I'm no longer just an Uber driver. Somehow, I've become a beacon unknowingly attracting those vulnerable to the wellspring's lure. The Mystical Wishing Well the clock in Langley Creek struck twelve and the town fell quiet. The old wishing well, covered in ivy and lit by hanging lamps, was a constant presence in the town square. The locals knew it held a certain magic. Tess approached the well under the moonlight. She had a reputation for being hard-working and tenacious. She tossed a coin into the well, silently asking for happiness. Suddenly, an entity appeared from within the well's darkness, breaking the silence to caution Tess that wishes often come with their costs. Fear crept into Tess's mind, her life dramatically changed. Her humble abode transformed, morphing into a haven of luxury. The once threadbare garments she wore were replaced by haute couture gowns that shimmied around her form. She exchanged the hustle and bustle of serving tables for the relative tranquility of an office job. A striking gentleman made his appearance at her doorway, cradling a bouquet of blooming roses in his arms. But as time wore on, things soured. Tess's new lover grew cold. Social gatherings felt forced. Bad luck seemed to follow Tess wherever she went. Broken mirrors littered her path. She stumbled upon black cats and thunderstorms broke out on clear days. One night Tess sat alone in the square reflecting on her recent misfortune when, once again, that entity surfaced from within the well's darkness. Its eyes glowed eerily through the dense fog that tended to be thicker as New Year's Eve approached. Whispers reverberated from within the well leading Tess into fog-shrouded streets armed only with a lantern for guidance. As she neared the well, fear gripped Tess like icy fingers. The wind carried haunting sounds that sent shivers down her spine. Tears streamed down Tess's cheeks as she stood resolute before the well, determined to right her wrongs. I won't let this curse torment our village any longer, she shouted. If my life is what it takes to end this suffering, then so be it. The entity chuckled, seemingly amused. Brave talk, it responded. But are you truly prepared for what you're asking? I am, Tess confirmed, taking another step forward. I will be the one to end this suffering, whatever it takes. With that final declaration, Tess leapt into the well disappearing below its dark surface. The gathering crowd watched in stunned silence as their worst nightmare unfolded. Tess's screams echoed through the night air as a monstrous beast emerged from beneath the water. Once human, time had twisted its form into something horrific. Its skin was gray and charred, its long limbs ended in claws, a deformed face with sharp teeth protruded from its lips and stared at the villagers with evil intent. Learn from this, the fiend roared. The well's power reflects your greed. It glared at them, then added, Your curse isn't just from the town, 
but from your hearts. Turning to the village elder, it announced, The curse ends tonight, but a new darkness will rise, a result of the narrow-minded desires that have blinded you to reality. In the sleepy hamlet of Langley Creek, Tess's story became the town's backbone, haunting and inspiring its residents in equal measure. The narrative carried the weight of an accursed settlement and an invisible beast that lurked within its shadows. The creature stalked without being seen, its existence marked by the unsettling rustling of leaves or an inexplicable shiver running down one's back. Tess was more than just a character in this spine-chilling tale. Even after her body had succumbed to death, her spirit remained. In the collective consciousness of Langley Creek, she evolved from a mere memory to an enduring symbol of courage and selflessness, defying the constraints of mortality. Thus, Tess persisted not just as a whispered legend, but a timeless symbol of bravery and sacrifice that would forever resound in the folklore of Langley Creek. Midnight Melody The clock hit midnight, and an uncomfortable quiet took over Rebecca's new home, a Victorian manor at the edge of town. Rain hammered on the windows, and a bone-chilling cold filled the air. The old house creaked and groaned around her, making the silence seem even louder. Rebecca had recently moved into this grand but eerie mansion because of one unique feature, an old piano in a dimly lit music room. A well-known pianist, she was intrigued by mysteries. As time passed, she sat down at the piano bench with excitement tingling in her fingers, ready to break the silence with music. The first few notes sounded strange but also deeply sad. Each note echoed through the room like footsteps in an empty forest. Her passionate playing seemed to awaken something within the house. Then it happened. A discordant note broke her melody like glass underfoot. It felt as though bony fingers had touched the keys beside hers. Startled, Rebecca glanced around but found herself alone in the room. She dismissed it as nerves and continued to play. The room became even colder as shadows danced along the walls like ghostly ballerinas, and a heavy feeling hung in the air. The music surrounded her as her fingers moved across the keys in a trance-like rhythm. Suddenly an eerie voice whispered, Rebecca. Her heart pounded as it said, Rebecca, play for us. The voice was mesmerizing and terrifying. As she played, time seemed irrelevant. Her heartbeat matched her music and ghostly figures danced around her. In the piano's polished surface, she saw a terrifying reflection. A woman's face twisted with pain, her eyes full of despair. Rebecca gasped, but there was no reaction from the woman. The apparition's screams blended with Rebecca's music, creating a distressing symphony of pain. Tears filled Rebecca's eyes. Suddenly, the room fell dark. The piano went silent. A chill permeated the warm air. Rebecca shivered, her heart pounding against her chest. She reached for her phone, but its light barely cut through the murk. As she tried to open the door, a chilling whisper spoke. Rebecca. You played beautifully, before turning into a haunting laugh. But now it's your turn to join us. Rebecca shivered as a cold grip seized her shoulder, yanking her toward an uncertain future. The mansion lay quiet, save for the soft strains of piano music threading through the air at midnight. She had become the latest victim of the Midnight Caller, a prisoner within the mansion's walls forever. The previously silent corridors now reverberated with sorrowful tunes, played by their newest eternal inhabitant, Rebecca, the young woman who yearned for intrigue but found herself trapped in a cruel twist of fate. 